we hear about terrible accidents, you know, plane crashes, things on land. It's awful. But um, what about when something goes wrong in like the deepest, darkest part of the ocean? It's a different kind of scary, isn't it? It really is. Almost alien territory. Exactly. And today, that's where we're heading. We're doing a deep dive into a story that, well, gripped everyone just last year. The Titan submersible disaster in June 2023. A truly challenging one. Right. So our mission today, for you listening, is to kind of cut through all the headlines and speculation. We want to give you a clear picture. What actually happened, why it's important, and crucially, what we learned. It's a story about... Big ideas, big risks, ambition. And ultimately, heartbreaking loss. Yeah. yeah. So let's start with the vision. Ocean Gate Expeditions, what were they trying to do? Well, it was audacious. You have to give them that. Ocean Gate, yeah. they're a private company, and their big goal was to take people, not just hardcore researchers, but adventurers, tourists, to down to see the wreck of the RMS Titanic. Which is incredibly deep. Oh, incredibly. It's sitting at 3,800 meters down. That's uh, nearly two and a half miles below the surface in the North Atlantic. A huge undertaking. And the sub they built for this, the Titan. Tell us about this. Okay, so the Titan. Picture something about the size of a minivan designed for five people, a pilot, and four passengers. Uh -huh. And the construction was, well, this is key. They used carbon fiber for the main hull, capped with titanium ends. OceanGate really pushed this as, you know, cutting edge, innovative. Right. They marketed it heavily. Low cost, deep sea access. Exactly. Disruptive technology, democratizing exploration. That was the language. But, and this is a big but, almost from the beginning, there were people raising red flags. Serious ones. Okay. So let's get into that. This chorus of caution, as some called it. What were the main worries? The warnings came from multiple directions, engineers within the field, even former employees, uh, deep sea exploration experts. They consistently pointed to worries about the Titan safety, specifically for the kind of extreme depths it was aiming for. And the carbon fiber hole was central to that. Absolutely central. See, carbon fiber is strong, very strong for its weight. But under the immense crushing pressures of the deep ocean, its behavior is... Well, it's less predictable than, say, titanium or steel. How so? Less predictable how? Metals tend to bend or deform if they're failing. They give you a warning, kind of. Carbon fiber composites, though, they can develop tiny internal flaws from stress fatigue that you can't easily see, and then they can fail suddenly, catastrophically, without warning. Okay, wow. That sounds incredibly risky for this application. It is, and that risk, that specific material concern, led directly to the next big issue the lack of testing and certification. Right. They weren't certified by the usual bodies. Not by the main ones, no. Organizations like DNV or ABS, the American Bureau of Shipping, these are independent groups that vet marine vessels, especially ones doing extreme things. Titan hadn't gone through their rigorous classification process for a vessel operating at these depths. Why not? Did OceanGate address this? They did. The CEO, Stockton Rush, he had a very... um shall we say, controversial view on this. He argued that regulations stifled innovation. He actually said, and this quote became infamous. I remember this one. Yeah. At some point, safety is just pure waste. Chilling. Pure waste. Yeah. That really tells you something about the mindset, doesn't it? It frames the whole approach, I think. Risk tolerance was extremely high. So despite these warnings, this lack of standard certification, this philosophy, mm -hmm. they kept diving. They did. Which brings us to June 18th, 2023. The day of the final dive. Yes. The Titan started its descent towards the Titanic wreck that morning. Five people inside. Let's name them. It's important. Mm -hmm. Stockton Rush, the CEO, piloting. Right. Then Hamish Harding, a British billionaire, known adventurer. Uh -huh. Paul-Henri Narjolet, a very famous French maritime expert, often called Mr. Titanic. He'd been down many times. A legend in that community. Absolutely. And then Shazada Dawood from a prominent Pakistani business family and his 19-year-old son, Suleiman. Just 19. So the five of them start the dive. And about an hour and 45 minutes in, silence. Communication with the surface support ship was lost. Just gone. Just gone. And what followed was, well, the world watched for incredibly tense days. Search and rescue teams scrambled, planes, ships. Everyone hoping desperately that maybe they were just stuck, maybe unable to surface, but still intact, maybe with air running out. There was so much hope, wasn't there? Maybe they'd snagged on something, maybe a power loss. All sorts of scenarios were being discussed. But then on June 22nd, the news came. 
and it wasn't good. What was the finding? The U.S. Navy. They revealed they had acoustic data, basically underwater sound detection systems, that had picked up something consistent with an implosion. An implosion. Near the Titanic wreck site, very shortly after the Titan lost contact on Sunday, they described it as a catastrophic implosion. Can you explain what that actually means at those depths? <laughs> yeah. The physics of it? It's almost impossible to comprehend the pressure down there. Like you said, 300, 800 meters. The water pressure is over 380 times what we feel here at sea level. Think about that weight pressing in from every single direction on the hull. Okay. If that hull fails, even a small breach under that kind of external pressure, it doesn't just leak or crush slowly. The collapse is inward, and it's incredibly violent and almost instantaneous. Instantaneous. Faster than the human nervous system can process pain or even awareness. We're talking milliseconds. The structure, the people inside, essentially disintegrated under that immense force, a violent inward crush. That's horrifying to even think about. So wow. given that brutal reality, what's the consensus now on why it failed? What was the weak point? The expert consensus really circles back to that main concern, the carbon fiber hull. The belief is that it failed due to accumulated damage material fatigue from previous dives or perhaps an undetected manufacturing flaw. Something that proper testing might have caught. Potentially, yes. Or something that using a more proven material like titanium for the entire pressure hull might have avoided. And again, crucially, this links back to the lack of certification by bodies like DNV or ABS. Their whole purpose is to rigorously test and validate designs and materials for exactly these kinds of extreme conditions. It seems like such a huge gap. How could they operate like this? You mentioned the regulatory environment. That's a key piece of the puzzle. They were operating in international waters, and they argued the Titan was experimental. This created a kind of legal and regulatory gray area. Not quite a ship subject to standard maritime law in the same way. Not quite something else. A loophole almost. Some would definitely call it that. And the truly heartbreaking part is, as we discussed, this wasn't a surprise out of the blue for many experts in the field. People had warned about this exact type of failure mode with this specific design philosophy. So it felt foreseeable to those in the know. Deeply foreseeable to many. In my experience studying deep sea vehicles, the ocean demands respect. It's incredibly unforgiving. Shortcuts on design, materials, testing. The consequences are just too high. Every single component is critical under that pressure. So when we look back, it feels like more than just a technical failure, doesn't it? It feels like decisions were made. Absolutely. This wasn't, you know, a rogue wave or an unexpected geological event. Five people died because of a chain of decisions. Decisions about risk, about priorities, maybe profit, maybe the desire to be first, maybe pride. A failure to heed warnings. A failure of responsibility, fundamentally. A failure to listen, a failure to adequately test, and maybe a failure to truly respect the sheer power of the environment they were entering. It really highlights that tension between pushing boundaries and ensuring safety. Exactly. Innovation is vital. Exploration is arguably part of human nature. But when innovation means sidestepping established safety protocols, especially when human lives are involved in such an extreme environment, well, it stops being exploration and starts looking more like recklessness. Those regulatory gray areas often turn out to be just danger zones. You know, the desire to explore, to see the unseen, it's powerful. It drives so much progress. But this feels like a stark reminder. Exploration without rigorous caution isn't bravery. It's gambling, gambling with lives. So what's the legacy of this? What are the lessons we absolutely have to take away? Well, the immediate impact was a massive re-examination of deep sea tourism, for sure. It threw a harsh spotlight on how private ventures, especially those claiming innovation, might operate outside traditional safety frameworks. Mm. It served as this incredibly potent, tragic reminder that the deep ocean isn't just another tourist destination. It is one of the most hostile frontiers on Earth. And as Stockton Rush's own submersible proved, there is absolutely no room for ego, no room for cutting corners when you're 3,800 meters down. The physics doesn't care about your vision statement. A very hard lesson learned. The hardest. So as we wrap up this deep dive, something maybe for you, the listener, to think about. This tragedy, the loss of those five lives, it needs to be more than just a news story we all followed for a week. It has to be. It has to be, as you said, a lesson. A lesson kind of etched into how we approach exploration, how we approach innovation, especially when the stakes are this high. Because the final thought is this. If we forget this lesson, if ambition consistently shouts louder than caution, if we let that hubris take over. We're just setting ourselves up to repeat it. Exactly. We're doomed 
to repeat tragedies like this. Maybe not in the deep ocean next time. Maybe in the sky. Maybe on land. Mm -hmm. Or maybe right back down there in the deep. It's a universal caution, isn't it? It really is. Caution has to be part of the innovation process, not something seen as opposed to it.